Okay, Ronnie, today, today may be, we, this is, this may be as close as we've ever gotten to our pursuit of, uh, a connection to someone around the Pixar movie inside out. Um, because our guest is, uh, is in the Los Angeles area. Which is like a geographic, physical connection. <laughs> yes, like, that's as close as we're going to get. As close as we've gotten so far to someone from from Inside Out. So no no pressure, Nathan. No pressure at all. <laughs> Am I supposed to whisper that little voice in uh, in your head just to tell you, you know, what's right or wrong? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to channel the, the Inside Out as much yeah. as I can. If if you could channel more the inside out, then my typical go to there is George Burns, uh, you know, and the you know the devil on one shoulder and angel on the other. So somewhere in between, right? I'll do my best. Yeah. Uh, so welcome to Group Thinkers, everyone. I'm your host Justin McCord, and uh, with me as always is Ronnie Richard. And uh, Group Thinkers is the podcast from RKD Group, where on every episode we talk with someone who's got a, a unique point of view doing something innovative in the nonprofit marketing space. And uh, and one of the things that we really like about our guest today is that we have a uh, a very complimentary point of view, as uh, as you all will hear. So welcome to uh, to Nathan Chappelle uh, to the show. Welcome, Nathan. Good to have you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. So Nathan, you're the uh, senior vice president, uh, senior vice president over at Donor Search, and you're also a co-author of uh, a new book that uh, is coming out. That is the Generosity Crisis: The Case for Radical Connection to Solve Humanity's Greatest Challenges. So just a little bit of a lofty idea yeah, with the book. Yeah. Yeah, we thought about calling it the generosity crisis, a book of hope, you know, but that didn't fly very well. You know, it, it actually, yeah. no, to be honest, we, we really struggled with naming the book generosity crisis and went back and forth quite, quite, a, quite a bit. And the publisher really um, encouraged us to, you know, essentially it's you, you don't write a book called generosity crisis to make friends uh, or to sell books, uh, you know, that are going to be in stockings for Christmas. But um, you write it because of a calling and, and a and, and because there's a story that needs to be told and and that you want to spark conversation so yeah i tend to be like this eternal optimist so writing a book called generosity crisis has not been an easy thing to do yeah. uh, but there's a different side of the story that we can talk about yeah well and and uh having been able to enjoy you know a treatment of the book i, I will tell you that there is uh, there's something that scratches that calling uh, that that I know I have into the space in reading the treatment and that optimism, even in the midst of um, you know some some very frank circumstances that we're facing. So I don't want to jump too far into it just yet. Uh, sure. I, I want to start by you talking about uh, talk about your calling, talk about uh, your career, share from us, you know, from Notre Dame to today, like fill in some gaps on how the heck you got here. Yeah, I mean, I, I well, it's 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 one of those topsy-turvy stories. Like most people, I didn't like ever, I didn't wake up as a, a child and say, well, I want to work in philanthropy for the rest of my life. And I didn't even know it was a career. Honestly, I was getting my MBA. I was on the board of directors at a Boys and Girls Club. Typical story. I, I think this happens a lot where, you know, board, board uh, the, the executive director quit. I was there. I just sold my business, going to getting my, uh, graduate degree and so i was like sure you know i'm naive i was like a lot younger 20 plus years ago and said sure i'll step in and, and help out and honestly i found um i thought i'd be there like six weeks just to like keep an eye on things while they hired someone new and i ended up there seven years at boys and girls club and, and honestly it was it was a calling because it 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 very quickly you know, change what my motivations in life were, which was like, I wanted to sell my company, go, you know, get my MBA, work on Madison Avenue. That was like my, that was my thing. That's what, that's what I really wanted to go do. And, uh, you know, when you're not aligned with where, what life's purpose is, you know, there's friction there, but when you become aligned with life's purpose, things start to flow. And I got to the point where I never felt like I went to work. I felt like I had a new way of life. Hmm. And so looking back, that was back in 2000, 
um, yeah, I spent the rest of my career in fundraising and I went back for a second graduate degree at Notre Dame and um, and it's just been amazing. Like I never thought I'd spend this long, you know, essentially, you know, doing good, you know, doing good business, but doing good with a variety of nonprofits and now on the, on the for-profit side, uh, amazing career. I mean, honestly, like for those that have fall, fallen into it or planned it, you know, I, I think, you know, I look at friends on the outside who, you know, they, they have really good livings doing other things, but that sense of purpose that you get when you're working in the nonprofit sector, you know, you get to see the good in the world and you get to be part of that. It's, it's special. You know, I don't think, I don't want to miss this point. Uh, commonly, when I share with someone, you know, you get into small talk or et cetera, and, and someone says, so what do you do? And when when you actually unpack uh, our role in philanthropy and in nonprofit marketing, they're always somewhat taken aback. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. It's very rare that you can have, you know, if, if you were just going to say, yeah, I'm in finance, I'm in business, I'm in real estate, whatever, whatever all those other things are, those still have their place. But I, that that sense of purpose is, is, is uh, it really comes out when people understand the connection to philanthropy. And sometimes there's jealousy in that too. Like I, you know, there's like, well, how do I get that? Like I've had friends mid-career try to switch and, you know, it's, it's a little, it's difficult because kind of the golden handcuffs, you get kind of settled in your career when you're younger, it's easy. You know, it's like, well, I'm not going to do pharmaceutical sales. I want to go into fundraising. You know, there's, you can translate those skills pretty easily, but later in your career, like I have friends that have very successful careers in, you know, high paying jobs that they look at what I do with this reverence of like, wow, like, I mean, it's a very, um, it is a very different type of work. And, and with that said, I think that calling is, it's more than your, your mission. It's more than the, the clients that you have. It's about philanthropy in general. Like I, and maybe it's just me, but I've been like, I'm, I feel like I'm like a guardian of generosity. Like it's my responsibility. Like I think all of ours is to protect that. Like I believe, and I've seen the power of philanthropy, but we all are part of that tribe that has to like care for that. And I, going back to your earlier question, that's really where the, you know, the, the idea or the calling for the book came because it was like, something's not right. You know, our, something is, you know, not doing well. We, we need to talk about some things together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we often say that fundraising, we believe fundraising is a noble profession. Yeah. And so it's again, very much aligned and, and it's important to reiterate those things because many of our listeners and colleagues, you know, it's it's also a very stressful uh, yeah. profession. And this is a very stress filled time for uh, for those in in nonprofit space. Yeah. It's so funny to use that word because, I, you know, so through most of my career, I started out as a fundraiser and then led fundraising teams and fairly large, you know, up, you know, 175, 200 million dollar a year annual goals and multi-billion dollar campaigns. And, you know, when I would would be doing an all staff or just, you know, mentoring someone, I would remind them that their work is not about them. You know, and it's it is a noble profession and and that being called to steward a relationship to do something together that neither party could do on their own. Like that, like that's just amazing. Yeah. Like how how do you like at the hardest day, you're right. I mean, it's difficult work, but the most difficult day you go home feeling like I did good. Like, you know, the, you know, I, I, I made a little bit of a difference today. So it is, it's noble work. I, I love it. Would have, I a thousand percent would do it again and again and again, if I had to pick over. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, likewise. And, and Ronnie, I'm, I'm going to speak for you and say that I, I've even seen that with your transition from, you know, the, from really journalism. Uh, as a profession into the space, you know, that uh, having also been in the, the you know, the journalism space, there was a, a, uh, a phrase that talked about getting ink in your blood and that once you have, once you've worked kind of in, in media on the publishing side, that you're really connected to it. And uh, there's something deeper in the space that we work now. So, sure. so, uh, so let's talk about this book. Uh, let's talk about, um, uh, generosity crisis and and just 
you know, what, what was the idea behind it? Yeah, you know, um, it, it actually goes back more than 10 years. I, I, you know, studied, you know, business degrees, but really more on the economic side. So I studied at Cambridge, macroeconomics at Cambridge. So I just always looked at things from like these, this macro lens of like, if this happens, then what, you know, and kind of looking out and absolutely don't consider myself any kind of like futurist, but I do like to think and in, in ponder on the correlations between things. And back in, in 2010, um, and kind of a history, a nerdy history buff when it comes to philanthropy too. In 2010, when the when the uh, giving pledge was created, you know, I had this this thought and didn't put too much thought around it for the first year or two. And then in 2012, I decided to study the effect of mega gifts. So really, is disparity of wealth. You know, what's going to happen? You know, number of billionaires are, is increasing pretty rapidly. Um, but with this giving pledge, there had not been as much conversation about philanthropy since like Rockefeller Carnegie. There's this like massive gap in time where mega gifts just kind of went unnoticed. They were happening, but they just didn't, they weren't in the in the spotlight of, of the media. So all of a sudden, you know, this this thing happens. And in 2012, I, I wrote this, um, it was actually a PowerPoint. It was this analysis on the evolution of mega gifts. And there's one of two things that could happen. One is that you know, this new kind of sense of, you know, mega philanthropy would inspire others to follow and, and join. And, you know, now that, you know, this generosity is a spotlight, that's just going to encourage so many other people. Um, and actually back then I went to India, we did polio, my wife and I did uh, polio inoculations in India with Rotary International. And that was a big Bill Gates thing. And so there was just like this really cool energy of like, you know, what's going to happen here. But the other thing, you know, the other thought was, you know, what What I didn't know what the term was at the time would, would essentially be, you know, um, the crowding out effect is that, you know, Gates and Buffett would fill the bucket and therefore, you know, maybe not me, but my neighbors and friends and family didn't really feel like their contributions were needed as much. And so ended up studying that for quite a while. I mean, never stopped, it not formally, but never stopped. I Every year, I kind of update how many billionaires how much was you know giving USA? I'd go through the fine print in the in the footnotes, essentially because giving USA takes out mega gifts from the from the total to not kind right. of right to sway things. And when you look at the rise of those gifts that are being taken out in comparison, you know, so ultimately the what happened is you know long story short, 20 years later, is giving remains at all time high, but it remains 2.1 percent of the GDP. And so there's like just simple math is like, well, if the bucket's still filled, but there's a, a lot more of the money is coming from a very small number of people, you have to conclude that a lot less people are giving. And um, and I think just informally for several years kind of talking about it, you know, I, was, uh, and I remember I was at in New York uh, on a panel talking about AI and the future of generosity. And I I said to the audience, I was like, you know, someone's got to write a book called The Generosity Crisis. Like I was like, really hoping that someone in the audience, like I remember even looking at a person in the front row, I'm like, and it should be you, like you should write it. Um, Cause I never it really thought I would write a book and I really didn't want to, but I felt like it was an important, an important thing to talk about because for the most part, now it's a little different this year, this year somehow this topic of the generosity crisis has become a little more in vogue, but yeah. for a majority of the last 20 years, like. I was like a lone wolf. Like I'd be like, yeah, but look, GDP and you know, mega gifts, and the people are like, you're an idiot. Like, don't don't say those words. Like, it's like Voldemort. Like you don't like don't talk about this stuff. And yeah, yeah. Now this year and last year, I think the pandemic allowed this conversation to be okay. And for me, it's more about awareness than anything. It's just it's it's not a prescriptive book by any stretch. It's there are some ideas. But it really is around creating this awareness. Like, if we continue on this path, bad things happen for our kids and their kids. Like, this is, you know, we they will live in a society that's far less generous than the one we live in. And I think we'd all agree, like, we'd like to live in a more generous society. Nathan, you talked about that that bucket remaining full, yet who's contributing to the bucket being very different. And you know, I think we've all seen that study from the Lilly School that shows from 2000, you know, when we look back at the year 2000, 66% of American households gave charitable donations. 
fast forward, you know, not quite 20 years because it stops in 2018, but it's down to 49.6%. So you're looking at about a 17 percentage point drop, which is huge when we think about it. So, you know, in thinking about that, you, you presented the problem, obviously. You said you don't exactly have prescriptive solutions, but what are some of those ideas? Like what can nonprofits do thinking about this issue and yeah. going forward? Yeah, yeah. And it, and and it's funny when you go through this process and you write a book, you know, at, when you're done with it, I'm a perfectionist. So it's like I would if actually if it wasn't for deadlines and publishers, like I'd I'd be like five more years, I'd still be like, but there's a new study and let's add that to that. And there's a new idea. You know, I feel that. You, yeah, you know, and, and back to your point, yeah, right, for, especially it's just like you got to let it go at some point, you know, and, and just put it out there, you know, to back to your earlier comment, that that trend line, the startling thing when we, we decided to write the book and it was like, you know, there's a story is that just simple math, if we follow that curve or that, that trend line down, giving ends in 49 years, like ends or in the single digits without any kind of intervention or stabilization, it ends. And I'm like, man, I, you know, I've got kids. We'll hopefully have grandkids in the, you know, I don't know, five or ten years. And it's like, what kind of world is that? Like, you know, so, so, so that there was, there's a reason. This is an inflection point for generosity, like for sure. Like, people need to talk about that. What, what we really get into. So that's half the book. The other half of the book is really this, um, a call to to rethink what we what we think we know about connection. And what I mean by that is that I think, you know, nonprofits were created to do something together that neither party could do on their own, right? So I couldn't do this on my own, the, the nonprofit could do it on their own, but together we could do something amazing. And and somehow over the years, um, and I think through a lot of, frankly, misaligned goals and metrics of what success is, and, um, you know, we live in a very different world, you know, one and a half or 1.7 million nonprofits all competing for each other, every for-profit company talking like a nonprofit competing for your attention. The the book really gets us to rethink what connection means. And I was listening to something the other day with Alexis de Tofil and, and his admiration for America was this idea of affiliation. Like people would like they they connect in their community and they'd get together and they would do these amazing things together and we've become so atomized as a society i mean of course from the advent of the tv to you know our supercomputers you know in our pocket you know we live very siloed lives the the call in the book is really to um not think more is better stop stop just thinking more is better not everyone is a donor you know, to your point, only 49.6% of Americans make you. So the world is not your oyster. But the argument is that if we took the time to really get to know people in intimate ways, like nonprofits used to do, and we've got lots of stories in the book about City of Hope, where I used to work, was a place where entire communities would come together. Like you would meet your future wife there at a dance that they would host for their community as a nonprofit because it was your family's identity. It's, it's really about this idea of getting back into really leaning into the conversation and the connection with people one-on-one. -on -one. And we had to come up with a new word for it because those words like affiliation and connection are so overused and, and frankly bought and sold every day. Like your, you know, your connection is being, it's out to bid, you know, the highest bidder every day. So we came up with this term, the only thing to call it was this radical connection which is not a, a one-way thing. It's not like I know you, you know, or I know this nonprofit or they know me. It's that I know you and you know me. It goes way beyond an affiliation. It goes way beyond a preference. It goes into a deep visceral connection, which we'd argue is a very limited quantity. Like my ability to connect at a visceral level with an organization or a person is a very limited quantity. I can't do that a thousand times. I can do that a dozen times. And so for people to be aware of what that connection is in that the value of that connection and to invest the right time um, and resources or, or whatever it might be into that connection, that's really what it comes down to. So it's a bit of flipping the pyramid. Like, honestly, it's like we all talk about these terms are like flip the pyramid. More is not better, but better, more better is better. And and we know this. And this is where I think our work is so aligned between what you do is this idea that all donors are not created equal. 
you know, only in direct response do we even talk about lifetime value, you know, and, and but why is it not talked about in even major gift fundraising? So lifetime value, you know, a, a donor stays with you is 15 to 16 times X a single donor. So more is not better, but more better is better, you know? So anyway, it's just, it's more of that call to, to rethinking what we think we know about what it means to connect with people. You know, I love that. And <laughs> Ronnie, you, your question was, what can nonprofits do to turn this around? And I'm sitting here thinking, yeah, but what about the responsibility of the donor? Like, because there is that two-way, you know, uh, piece to it. And and when you, when I sit and wrestle with the uh, the decline in donors, the decline in households, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I start to think about, okay, well, how did how did the idea of philanthropy come into my my purview? Right, and it came into my purview because I watched my parents write a check and put it in an offering plate. Like that was the the basis, that was the foundational element. And even, you know, the my kids don't see me do that because it's all online and it's happening behind the scenes. And so I have to be very intentional as a donor in helping pass that torch on. So there's like yeah. this, there's this really interesting responsibility of the donor as well which i appreciate nathan that you you talking about like the importance of philanthropy from both sides and and meeting there in the middle um well you know it's interesting in fact i got an email yesterday the generosity commission was established uh it's being funded by you know private support and general and giving usa a bit and they're really the, it's a short-term project right to study what's going on generosity in america yesterday they sent an email out it's not surprising, but you know exactly to your point that 55% of the people that they just surveyed said that philanthropy was modeled by their their family when they were a kid. You know, so <clears throat> that's the troubling part, right? Because what is um, and, and traditionally um, religion in all, any religion, you know, had been that that vehicle that trained most people in the virtues of giving. You right. know, and, and you know this idea that you know people that. Um, have that associate with any religion are more likely to be a donor and also give twice as much. So what is that? What is that replacement? So I think this is about it is a responsibility of the donor. It's a responsibility of me talking to my kids, but it's also me talking to my 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 kids' friends and my neighbors. And for us to actually talk about what does generosity mean to us and uh, what role do we play? Because that's the scariest thing. If yeah. that no one is talking about it. It just kind of evaporates. Yeah, yeah, and and you know the 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 book also talks about the importance of you know giving of your your time in addition, right? right? And and right. you know I I find that to be an a, a an understated part of philanthropy and and you know our our recent study that we put out you know it's been a couple of months now but the listen up study it. it we talked about this correlation as well and so you know when donors feel valued and when they feel involved which typically means that they are involved in some way um, their relationships grow stronger and their giving goes up and so it's you know thinking about strategically from the nonprofit side okay how do i make nathan feel valued and feel involved right and how do I make Ronnie feel valued and involved? And it is a one-to-one -one thing. It's not a how do I, you know, broadly communicate to both of these, you know, folks or to hundreds or thousands of them. Yeah, I would I would say too. I mean, as I'm sure you see this every day in your work, is that as you know, we live in an extremely personalized end of one world where you know whether it's American Express or you know, Audi knows me and when I'm going to buy a car or what I'm going to do or where I'm traveling. And, and we've gotten so used to that idea of personalization, you know, and just by a sheer experiment, I turned off all of my recommendations on Amazon about six months ago, just to prove a point. And I, I was like, I just want to see what happens. And the very first thing it, it recommends that I buy was fingernail clippers. And I was getting like bombarded with like, you need to buy fingernail clippers because they didn't know me at all. Like we become, you know, we're, we we take so much for granted that these like companies know what we want. When we turn that off, it's like startling. But then mm. 
you know, the juxtaposed position is like nonprofits, like, you know, not, I mean, I don't think we're in the dear alum space anymore. That's just like, you just can't even survive if you're doing that. Right. But I do think that expectation for individuals from a nonprofit are much higher than what's being delivered in most cases. And so I think as we, we have to admit and acknowledge, like, it really comes down to, you know, if you can't do micro personalization or micro segmentation, you need to get much better at, you know, communicating the right message at the right time with the right person. Uh, fortunately, there is technology that exists that has never existed before at scale that's affordable in the nonprofit sector that, you know, I, I think the future is bright from that perspective. I think in several years, we'll be able to do literally like N of one fundraising because um, that's what our our constituents deserve. Like they deserve to be heard. Like I share in the book, but the worst thing I ever heard from a donor ever was why is the only time I hear from you is when you want money. Hmm. And it's horrifying, right? Because we're not communicating hmm. in ways that feel personal and are, are meaningful, you know, in between those asks. And so uh, there's a lot of work to do, but, but it's not overwhelming. Like it really comes down to, you know, putting your, your, the lens of like, what do I want to receive as a donor? Like, how would I feel? And, and really, I, I think if anything, stop trying to boil the ocean and then take that extra energy and effort and, and push that into more personalized communication that you can have with a, a group of people that are going to go the distance with you. Yeah. I, I, I... God, we are so on the same page. We're so on the same page, even down to the use of technology. And, and you know, there, there are a lot of times to where uh, there tend to be, I think there's one communicated and one not communicated, but observed trend around uh, technology adoption and implementation. You know, the observed trend is it's easy to put up barriers. Sure. It's easy. It's easy to say, well, our data is messed up and, you know, or, yeah. well, you know, we don't want to just buy another piece of technology or, well, you know, to, to have all these objections come up as to why you can't use technology. And, and, and I think the observed factor there is that it's, it's most likely a problem of sequencing. Meaning like, okay, well, what's your first decision? And then what's your next decision? And then what's your next decision? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, having spent 20 years in fundraising, you know, really, actually for me, always had kind of like a business hat. Like I used to use the term ROI and like in 2005, and I was always afraid my car was gonna be keyed after a, a conference. Cause like people were like, <laughs> oh, okay, with hearing about things like ROI and fundraising. So we've come a long way in our industry um, but I agree that there's there's a long ways to go. I I sometimes, you know, nonprofit organizations just can't help themselves because they feel like, and, and it, a lot of it it's because of the motive, expectations for cost per dollar raise and things like that. You know, the ability to innovate um, is tough for nonprofits because of how you know whether it's uh, we don't have to name names, but any of the rating services that evaluate, you know, success means efficiency. And so nonprofits just feel penalized for trying to innovate if something doesn't go right. In fact, I did a panel um, with a large hospital last week and we were using um, one of the questions I was uh, interviewing them was, you know, what's your tolerance for risk? And when we talked before, they wanted, they actually had me remove the word risk from the question and you, what's your tolerance for innovation? Because, you know, and I get it, no blame, because like when I was in nonprofit, it was like, well, I can't risk my donor dollars. My board's going to kill me like or we're not going to, you know, so it's it's really tough. But I do think that um, there needs to be a change in mindset. Yeah. You know, people need to realize like things like AI are not it's not a fad. Like this is not going away. The largest companies in the world are all AI companies. Yeah. Um, and AI drives efficiency and personalization like that's what it does. And so. I, I still feel the, feel the future is bright, but to your point, there, there's a ways to come. Like we've got to, um, it can't just be the early innovators or the early adopters anymore. It's It's got to be at scale. But Nathan, if we're thinking about this from the nonprofit's perspective, like Justin mentioned the sequencing, like you, yeah. you know, you have to start somewhere and what is that sequence of where you start building this? So we know moving towards personalization 
it certainly requires clean data, good data, effective data. Is data that first step? Like, because we know nonprofits certainly have their challenges when it comes to data. Sure. Do we need to fix data first? Like, is that where we begin? That that's it's always the very first question. It's always the largest barrier and the single biggest barrier that actually, to be honest, is not nearly as big as people give it credit for. So if you're using only the nonprofit's data, then yes. Like if you're if you're say you're building models, the AI models on only a client's data, the data should be, you know, it should have decent hygiene. So it's actually kind of two answers to this. But AI should never rest on a single data set. So you should always enrich that data with outside data. There's so much really good data. You could take, you know, Ronnie Richard, add a thousand or four thousand data points to that that would really essentially um, distribute out the, the uncleanliness part of it to a broader, you know, much broader um, kind of more holistic view. Uh, but with that said, the other the other thing that nonprofits have to realize, is that this type of approach that we're talking about is so fundamentally different than what anything that's existed in the past, which is got to have your clean data because I'm going to build a model from 12 data points or 18 data points, which is a classic regression model. And they better be right because if they're not, you know, we're going to pay the price. Well, the big, big, big difference in AI models is that first, your model's never done it will never be done. You're not building it one time and then put it on the shelf and it's fixed and you're going to score it. It will never be done. And and then the other part is it is being able to enrich it with so much more data that it kind of distributes that out. So I think getting over the fear that you've got one shot at it, most organizations, I think this is a big barrier, had tried models in the past and they tried looking at personas and it didn't work because their data wasn't clean. They had a fixed amount of data and it wasn't clean and they felt burned and they don't want to try something new. But this new era of, of essentially machine learning, deep learning is so different. It's it's hard for people to get their arms around like how different it is. Mm. So it's more about trusting like, we'll never be done. You gotta start where you start and you try to enrich data um, to help, you know, essentially distribute some of the, the, the data that way. And when you say you'll never be done, you mean, it continues to collect data and use the data it's collecting as it's working, right? Yeah, true machine learning is learning, right? So like the Amazon algorithm is essentially being retrained continuously based on your buying and viewing and sharing habits. And so, you know, if it hadn't, it would still be, you know, it'd still be recommending fingernail clippers. And so it's just every time, so this, this never, you'll never be done is essentially every day, this is a, just a big paradigm shift for nonprofits. People are not fixed in time. There is no such thing as a donor or a non-donor or a good donor or bad donor. You have lots of people that that know you to different levels. They they are they're connected to you from very little to very high. And at the at at what what's different is that that connection changes every day. So every day. Um, if you think about like a hospital, someone either has a patient visit or they don't, or they attend an event or they don't, or in higher ed, they get a degree or they don't, or they, they volunteer in an alumni association or not. So organizations have to stop thinking about people as like binary terms, as fixed, like donor, not donor. It truly is like this idea of precision philanthropy, like N of one, like every person is on a unique path. Now, it's still a ways away. I mean, I think from five years from now, I think we'll look at it. I mean, that's not that far out. But if I look at AI five years ago from what we do now, it doesn't even look remotely similar. It is so vastly different. It's better. It's faster. I mean, it's it's a lot better. And it's way more adaptive. So five years from now, is it possible to think that every person has an individualized strategy? 100%. Mm -hmm. you know, based on, you know, where, you know, where they're at, you know, the right, you know, the right time, the right, you know, ask and all that good stuff. Oh man, golly, we're just, I, I wish we could continue talking. I wish this was, this is one where we might have to do like multiple conversations, Nathan, because this is, we could sit here and talk for three hours about this stuff. Yeah, really I feel like this is a great conversation. You know, and, and you're right. I mean, it's, it, yeah, I remember having a conversation a couple of years ago of, of basically saying, we're all analysts. At this point, 
if you're in fundraising, you're an analyst. Yeah. And that requires that requires that you have some data set that you're looking at to make decisions. And yeah. and so the sooner that we embrace that and find ways to uh, to scale it and leverage it, you know, I think the we will see even some of the ups and downs and fluctuations of this past year. Right. I think that you could iron through some of those easier if we have better data practices and better analysis practices into strategies that are personalized. Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, it's, it's, I'd be happy to. I I love this. Obviously, I mean, for me, AI is a means to an end. So there's this idea of like less people are giving less. And we used to use terms that when I was at City of Hope, like you got to work smarter, not harder. Well, this mm -hmm. is the way you do it. I mean, really it is, you know, it, it allows us to rethink that connection and quantify connection in real time. Like we've not been able to do that. So while it comes down into the real simplistic, like it's about people connecting with people in, in an intimate way, technology is a tool that can allow you to do that faster and with accuracy at scale. Yeah. Um, not all people are created equal. Not all donors are created equal. So how do you weed through the 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 data forest and and make sense of that? So there's yeah. hope. I mean, I absolutely there's hope if if we're willing to quote unquote take risk and it's not that much risk anymore. Um, start where you start and um, and really rethink connection. I, yeah. I, I'm so big on that. Just rethinking what it means to connect with people. That's very cool, man. Well, listen, uh, the book is The Generosity Crisis, and so uh, you can find it. It's available uh, on Amazon, right? Yeah, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. All, we're all, I, we're all books are sold, I guess. <laughs> we're bo all books are sold. You can also get some fingernail clippers if you're right. interested, <laughs> uh, you know. And so, um, so, Nathan, we really do, we appreciate you taking time to to share with us a part of your story and this pursuit we really appreciate the pursuit that you have and the calling that you have to to raise the profile of this conversation well and i huge shout out to you guys because you know everything i've read that you do i mean we're we're so <laughs> we're so aligned in this approach um your work is really refreshing to be honest when i read it i mean it's it doesn't look like a lot of the other work that's out there because it it's talking about the value of building long lasting relationships, not just get more revenue over the transom, you know? And, and honestly, yeah. that's a big reason why philanthropy is in the way it, 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 in this, in the situation it is because we've treated people like ATMs and yeah. your work is so aligned with this idea of, you know, a new way of like bringing people along through the journey, you know, and keeping them. So I love it. Kudos to you all um, and continue doing that because it's, it's really great work. Right on. Well, no, we appreciate that very, very much. Uh, and yeah, we'll we'll have to we'll continue this conversation. And uh, and you know, I think that as we, especially as we get into 2023, and we see how this year end pans out, I think it's going to give us even more data points. And uh, and who knows? I mean, you know, there there is a trend where the uh, election cycles and the midterms typically spur some sort of innovation for us each time. Yeah. And so, you know, there's all sorts of things that are that are uh, bearing down on us that are forcing our hands. And I, yeah. I like that. I think that that's yeah. a good place for us to be. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Nathan, thanks for uh, for joining us today. Uh, you can check out any and other episodes of Group Thinkers uh, on rkdgroup.com. Uh, also, just anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you can find our entire archive. Uh, as well as other pieces of work from Ronnie and the, the team, all available on our website. So be sure to check those out. And uh, yeah, no, thank you all for check, uh, for taking in this episode and we will see you next time. See you down the road.